Hey, if we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Tyler Wolf, and I'm the campus pastor here at Bridge Church in Oconomowoc. Thank you so much for being here this morning. That was kind of poor planning. We didn't know that I'd be preaching live today when we recorded and planned that video out. But really, do I, I do want to say thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, as I was down there meeting with the Convoy of Hope team, they are so, so grateful for local churches like you, like us, who are willing just to sacrifice a little to help people who are hurting a lot. I want to recognize a special group of people that are here with us today. There's a church in Greenfield uh, called Ridge Community Church. They are planting a campus, a second campus of their church in Oak Creek. And so they came, they're going to be portable just like us, and they came to shadow us. And so as I pray for the message today, I want to welcome them to church here at Bridge Church. So, And I also want to pray for them as they get ready to plant a second campus to make the name of Jesus even more famous in the Milwaukee area. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. I thank you personally just for the privilege that it is to be able to teach from it. I pray that there would be more of you and less of me. I pray that we would have the privilege and the honor of hearing your voice in individual ways as well as corporately as a body of people who um, are gathered here in the name of the love of Jesus. And Lord, I pray blessing over the Ridge team. Thank you so much for bringing them here with us. I pray that you would bless them as they plant their church. Bless Pastor Forrest with the power of the Holy Spirit uh, as he leads that campus and their whole team, Angie and everybody, as they do what you've called them to do in the city of Oak Creek. I pray that in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. We are in a sermon series, part two, called Better Questions. And we are looking at different parts of our life and saying, okay, what is our typical perspective that we jump to in this arena of life? And what's a better way to look at it? And the way that we're doing that is by asking better questions, because we believe that better questions means better perspective. And today, this morning, is all about thinking about our life in narrative terms, in terms of the story that we're writing with our everyday life. And so here's the question of the day. Here's the better question. What story do I want to tell when this is just a story that I will tell? You understand that we're in the present moment, but in the future, this will be the past. And everything we're going through right now, everything we're dealing with, is eventually going to be a story that we tell. And so we want to think about each day that we live, each interaction that we have, each conflict that we have with this perspective. What story do I want to tell when this is just a story that I will tell? And we love a good story. I love a good story. I heard one recently about this guy named Bruce. And in the late 80s, he lived in California, and he loved the sport of boxing. And so every weekend, he would sit down and he would watch that weekend's boxing match. Boxing was a lot cooler then than it is now. And he would watch boxing, and he loved all the fighters. He was into it, he followed the sport, but there was another character in the sport of boxing that he just kind of really got attached to and really liked. And that man's name was Michael, and he was the ring announcer. And so you may not know that you know who Michael is, but you do know who he is. You've at least heard his voice or his phrase because he was the guy that would come out into the center of the ring, he would announce the boxers, and then he was the guy who would say, let's get ready to rumble, okay? And he was just like world famous, this phrase, and this guy Bruce was watching because there's just something about this guy. And so he did some research, and he found out who that ring announcer was. And oddly enough, that ring announcer had the same last name as Bruce. And other people started to notice it. Well, Bruce was on a road trip to San Francisco in California with his dad. And uh, he, he looked at his dad and he said, Dad, do you know anything about this ring announcer? And Bruce at this point is 29 years old. And he goes, Dad, do you know anything about this ring announcer? Uh, he has the same last name as me. Are we related to him in some way? And his dad turns off the radio. How many know? If your dad, you ask him a question and he turns off the radio, you know what I'm saying? He turns off the radio, he doesn't want to talk about it, okay? He turns off the radio, radio he's about to drop a bomb on you, okay? And he says to his dad, who is this guy? His dad turns off the radio and he says, son, before I went to World War II, I got married. She got pregnant. I returned from the war. We got a divorce. And that child was placed in foster care at the age of two. I haven't seen him since. I believe that that ring announcer is your half-brother. So one thing led to another, and Bruce was like, well, if I have a half-brother out there, I haven't met him for the last almost 30 years of my life, I have got to meet this guy. So he put the pieces together, and he scheduled a meeting with this world-famous ring announcer who he believed to be his half-brother. They proved that it was his brother. 
And he said, well, if you grew up in foster care, how did you, how do you still have your last name? He said, well, I grew up with a different last name. And when I enlisted in the military, turns out that my last name was Buffer the whole time. Same as Bruce. And they formed a wonderful brotherhood. They made up as much as they could for all of that last time. And they, it was just this amazing story of separation in their entire lives. And I loved it when I heard it, but it got even better. Bruce Buffer found out that his brother Michael Buffer uh, hadn't licensed his trademark term. Let's get ready to rumble. So they became, he was his manager. And he, they began to license this phrase out to wrestling matches and out to movies. So not only did they have a friendship, but they also had a brotherhood. But then they began a business partnership. And together, based on that phrase, let's get ready to rumble alone, Bruce Buffer and Michael Buffer earned over $400 million together, okay? Where are they at? They need to pay for our new building, you know what I'm saying? Come on, you, all you did is speak into a microphone, dude. So they made over $400 million together. Amazing story, but it gets even better. Michael Buffer, every weekend, would just step into the center of the ring and say his phrase, let's get ready to rumble. His, now bro- his brother and best friend and now business partner and manager says, I think I could do what he does. Then the UFC started. That's not boxing. That's MMA. It's cage fighting. And they needed a ring announcer. So Bruce Buffer said that he would try out what his brother got famous doing. And he, for the last 25 years, has been the announcer with his famous phrase. Steve knows it. Steve Lopez. He says, it's time. If you watch the UFC, you know exactly what it is. You've watched it every Saturday for the last 100 years like I have. Okay? It's just this amazing story of lost time and connection and business partnership, and then this guy using his gift that's just clearly in his blood to be now a millionaire himself. It's just amazing. And every story like that one has, of course, like a beginning and a middle and an end. It has conflict and resolution. That's every story. But I believe that some of the truly great stories have a few key elements that if they were gone, we would certainly miss them. In fact, we probably wouldn't even remember the stories if they didn't have three things. Some form of conflict or suffering. Someone capitalizing on the gifts that they've been given. And then a grace connection. And so I want to look at each one of these as we look at a story in Scripture this morning. And I want to look at conflict. I want to look at someone capitalizing on their gifts. And I want to look at connection and ask each one of these parts of our life a better question in order to tell a better story. Because, you know, sometimes there's questions and then there's always a better question. Like, here's a good question. Do you want a cookie? I love that question when people ask me that, okay? Here's a better question. How many cookies do you want? You understand? All right? There's always a better question. Here's one for the junior high boys, okay? Should you wear Axe ax body spray today, okay? All right, here's a better question. Should you just maybe take a shower? You know what I'm saying? All right? Those of you who have been camp counselors know exactly what I'm talking about. Take a shower, all right? Dominic, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so in the book of Genesis, there's a man named Joseph whose story has all of these elements. Suffering and conflict, connection and grace, a person capitalizing on their gifts. And we find his story in the book of Genesis chapters 37 through 50. Listen to Joseph's suffering. Listen to Joseph's conflict and how much we remember this story because of the suffering that he was willing to endure, embrace, and trust God in the middle of. And as you hear Joseph's story, I want you to think about your own conflict. I want you to think about your own suffering. Have you had a perspective in the midst of your conflict that makes your story worth telling, that makes your story worth remembering? So here's Joseph. There's this young man named Joseph. He had many brothers, and he had a dream that his parents and that his 11 brothers would all bow down to him. We see this in Genesis 37, verse 9, where it says, The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars all bowed down to me. He said, and then he goes, he wakes up, and he tells his parents this dream. He tells his 11 brothers this dream, and they received it very well. No, they didn't. They're like, what are you talking about? You're the younger brother. We're never going to bow down to you. So naturally, the brothers were not like, a fan of their brother, right? They're not a fan of their brother, Joseph. And so they decide to kill him. Like, we're going to kill him, 
and we're going to tell our dad that he was killed by wild beasts in the field, okay? But then the reasonable, brothers, reasonable brother steps up, and he goes, you guys, he's our brother. We can't kill him. Let me be the voice of reason here. Let's sell him into slavery. You know what I mean? And they're like, okay, good idea. So they, they sell him to the Egyptians to be a slave. And Joseph starts down this path of enslavement, and he works his way up the ladder until he is essentially like the head servant in a leader's house named Potiphar. And something happens in his story that's so interesting because he used to just be working the fields at home with big dreams, big aspirations. One day my mom and dad and brothers are going to bow down to me. Next thing you know, he is the target for murder. He's sold into slavery, and now he has worked his way up. Things are looking a little bit better. He is the head slave at, or the head servant at a powerful leader's house. But then that leader's wife tries to sleep with Joseph. She goes up, and she says, hey, let's, let's get together. And he says no. But how he says no is very important for us today. In Genesis chapter 39, verses 8 and 9, here's what Joseph says to her as he plans to sleep with him, him with her, and take his story in a totally different direction. Here's what he says. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except for yourself, because you're his wife. Watch this part. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Do you see what Joseph is saying here? Joseph tells her the story of his life so far, right? Right? She knows his story, but he goes, here's how I'm thinking about this uh, proposition that you're making with me, lady. He goes, I came here as a slave, and I worked my way up. I just served my way into this room. I just served until I got to the point that I was in charge of everything, and I have access to everyone and everything except for you. Joseph is saying, do you see, lady, that you are offering me a plot twist for a story that I'm not interested in telling. You see how important it is to think about our story and ter- or our lives in terms of a narrative or a story? So is this how I want to tell this story? That I said yes to her? That I said yes to him? That I said yes to that? What story do I want to tell when this is just a story that I tell? And because he makes the right decision, she is offended by his conviction and accuses him of rape, and he's thrown straight into jail. He was in charge in this leader's house, and now he's in jail. Now, Joseph's story was full of suffering, and it's in suffering that we're faced with questions. In this moment, as I suffer, as I face this conflict, what story do I want to tell? And here's the temptation. Here's the temptation in suffering or conflict is to live a story that when it's all said and done, because whatever it is that you're going through, and I don't say this to minimize anything, whatever it is that you're going through, this will pass. And this will be a story that you look back on. This will be a season that you look back on, a story that you one day will tell. And so when we lose a loved one. Many of you remember uh, a member of this church, his name was Chris Rystead, and we lost him in 2020. And I got to go, and it was such a painful loss when we lost Chris. And I got to go and officiate his sister's wedding last night, and some of Chris's music got to be a part of the ceremony. And so naturally, as I just hung out with his family, there were so many stories of loss and heartbreak remembering this person. But they were stories of people saying, and I remember I had to trust God in that season. And so when we lose a loved one, do we just blame God and walk away, or do we wrestle him? Do we wrestle with him and our doubt and our anger and our struggle? Which, if you open the Bible for about five minutes, you'll notice that God welcomes that wrestling. 
He welcomes that struggle with him. He welcomes the question, and he doesn't buckle underneath the, the weight of our anger or doubt or questions. When we struggle with our finances, do we give up or do we be dishonest in order to make ends meet? Or do we choose to just keep on trusting God to meet every need that we have? Maybe your conflict is you have a prodigal son or daughter on your hands. I was that prodigal son or daughter for so much of my life, keeping my parents up at night just waiting for that phone call to say, your son has died. As then I was running around. You know, you have that, you have to think about that prodigal son or daughter in a narrative form. And this is straight from my parents. As they spent so much time trying to control me and just like, get me to change in all of my drug addiction and all of the dark life that I was living, right? And eventually they received a word from one of their pastors and he said, sometimes you have to let the prodigal run their path. You have to let them run your path. And if you're ever going to do that, you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to trust God with the life of your son or daughter. I'm not talking about giving up. I'm talking about giving in and surrendering to God that he wants its very best for the prodigal in your life. And so thinking in narrative terms can be so helpful. Think about every great movie or show that you watch. Now imagine it without the conflict. Imagine it without the suffering. Now maybe this works for you, maybe it doesn't, but this has certainly been a helpful mantra to me as I've suffered, as I've lost people that I've loved, is not that the loss was some plot piece in a story, but it was just me saying, this is a good episode. I'm not saying this is fun. I'm not saying I like this. I'm not saying I wanted this to happen or that I would wish it on anyone, but I just tell myself, this is just an episode in my story. And so the better question for suffering, the better question for conflict is, will I let this circumstance make me bitter or will I allow it to make me better? What story do you want to tell when this is just a story that you tell? Every great story has conflict. And we need to have the right perspective on the conflict in our lives. Another thing that every great story has, or that some of the great stories that makes them great, is someone capitalizing on their gifts. The, the easy example and one that I love is the story of Rocky Balboa, where he was just like bottom of the barrel, nobody living in the streets of Philadelphia, but he could throw a punch. And so he worked on the punch, and he worked on his footwork, and he slowly just capitalized on the gifts that he had to become the heavyweight champion in the world and get Adrian. You know what I'm saying? Right? He worked his way up because he capitalized on his gifts. Here's what happens to Joseph. After the accusation, the false accusation from his master's wife, Joseph gets thrown into jail. There, he meets two cellies, okay? He meets two other inmates that have these dreams that they can't make sense of. And he goes, man, there, there, we have these dreams, and Joseph has the gift of interpretation. And so he's in jail. He has every right just to give up. He has every right just to throw in the towel. I can't say that I wouldn't do that. But instead, he goes, I have a gift that I can use not to get out of jail because how can interpreting a dream get you out of jail as far as he could see? He goes, I have a gift that I can use just to serve these people. And so he interprets the dreams of these other two prisoners and it was a proper, it was a right interpretation. One of those prisoners is released from prison and two years later he's working for the leader of the nation named Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is troubled because he then is having these dreams, and he can't make sense of them. And so he brings in all the best, like, magicians and interpreters to interpret these dreams, and no one can do it. And that prisoner remembers his cellmate from two years ago. And he says, I know a guy. He's in prison, but he can interpret your dream like he interpreted mine. And that former prisoner remembers him. Joseph is called out of prison to interpret the dream of Pharaoh. This is in Genesis 41. Joseph works his way up to being second in command. The Pharaoh is so impressed by him. And he works his way up to being second in command over the entire nation. Started from the bottom, and here he is. Right? Have you ever heard the term, like, nepotism? 
Nepotism is when someone gets favor in the workplace because they're related to the boss, right? We hate nepotism. We hate these stories. We want to see these people that get promoted just because of their connections brought down. And if you don't agree, you're lying, and you need to pray, okay? Right? But Cinderella stories, we love those stories. When someone starts from the bottom and they work their way up, based on just the gifts they had or their character or their faithfulness. Because someone working their way up based on what they have been given. And that's one of the things that makes the story of Bruce and Michael Buffer so great. Is he just came in with his business sense and him and his brother made $400 million. He came in and he became just as famous as his brother in a different sport for doing the same thing, ring announcing. Right? He just used the gifts that he had. He just used the voice that he had. And so the better question to live a story worth telling is this. Are my gifts being used to write a better story, or are they being wasted? Are the gifts that God has given me, maybe it's a talent, maybe it's just a baseline ability. I could set up a chair. Man, I can can carry a conversation with someone at Shorehaven and just make them feel loved and make them feel welcome. That's not a talent. That's just ability. That's a, that's a willingness, right? Are the gifts that I've been given used to write a better story, or are they being wasted? And here is the challenge that I want to just submit to you this morning, that I, that I say this to young people all the time that are in Bible college, and this is something that I've committed to my life. It's just this. Serve your way into whatever room that you want to be in. Now, we don't go and we don't be kind to people and generous with people and serve others so that we can get something, but just saying, I am never going to get around these people. I am never going to do anything by my connections. I am going to just be committed to serve the people that God has put in front of me. It might be a spouse. It might be a coworker, but I'm going to serve my way, not weasel my way into a room. I'm going to serve my way into whatever room that I want to be in. When I got married, or when I got engaged to be married, I decided to run. So I, could, I had no money, so I couldn't afford a gym membership. And I said, well, I want to get in shape for this wedding. So I started running. I started to love running. And surprise, surprise, that addict wiring in my brain went off. And I was just like, I was running for like five minutes before I was just like, I'm going to run 20 marathons. Here we go. So I ended up running a marathon. I signed up, and I registered for the mar- marathon, and I ran my fir- first marathon, and it was incredible Super painful, full of suffering, and I loved it because I'm a little bit crazy. But I started to look at the finances, and I was just like, hold on a second. I just suffered for four hours, and I paid to do it. I'm really crazy here. This is, this is, I just feel like I just got robbed again. I feel like this is the old days, you know what I'm saying? I just paid to run a marathon. And so I said, but I want to keep on doing it. I want to run as many marathons as I can. In fact, you can ask my wife. I said, Alyssa, one day I'm going to run 12 marathons in a year. And, um, and so I just knew that I wasn't going to be able to afford to do that. I didn't have the money to run 12 marathons in a year. But what I did have was a camera and the ability to edit videos. So I started sending emails to marathon organizers, and I said, hey, listen, I would love to come and run your marathon, and I will film it, and I will create a promotional video for you to put on your YouTube channel just in exchange for a free marathon. And race directors go, okay, well, sometimes videographers cost thousands of dollars. Some of you guys that are business people are like, man, Tyler, you could have made a lot more money, (laughs) probably. But I just wanted to run free marathons. And so I never pay. I ended up running seven marathons, and I never paid for another marathon after that first one because I just said, that's a room I, wa- I want to be in. What gifts do I have that will get me in there? Let me use them to serve my way into the room that I want to be in. And that's a story that I get to share with, honestly, just like my sons, and say, hey, where do you want to go? Don't weasel your way in. Don't pay your way in. Serve your way into whatever room you want to be in. Those are the stories that we love when someone capitalizes on the gifts that they had to write a better story. What story do I want to tell when this is just a story that I tell? And finally, in the story of Joseph, he ends up getting connected back with his brothers. And every story that we love, there's a grace connection. And every story has a set of characters. There's a hero There's a villain and there's victims. And Joseph was faced with the choice in all of his suffering. 
Will I be the hero? Will I be the villain or the victim? The victim says this, poor me. The villain says, I will take vengeance on my brothers. And the hero says, look at me now. I started from the bottom and now I'm here, right? And what's so interesting and what sets apart Joseph's story is that he doesn't choose any of them. This is amazing. He doesn't choose any of them. We never see him lay down and complain, be the victim. We never see him take vengeance on his brothers who put him there in the first place. That's the villain. But he also never takes the position of the hero. And that's the difference between a good story and a great story. That's the difference between a good story and a good news story. Because in the telling of the, wo- the woman that he won't sleep with her, here's what he says. He says, hey, God is worthy of more honor than for me to sleep with you. He doesn't say, I'm a man of honor. I won't do that. He says, God is a God of honor. He puts God at the center. In Genesis 41, Joseph is about to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams, but he makes it clear. He doesn't say, yeah, I can interpret your dream for you. He says, hey, it's not, he, these are his words. It's not in me. God will give you a favorable answer. See, he made God the hero of his story. And what do we, all, anytime we see The God, the Father, the three parts of the Trinity interacting with one another, they're always putting someone else out in front of them. Jesus, when he was ready to be crucified and resurrected three days later, he says, I'm going to go, but wait till the Holy Spirit's coming. Someone better is coming in my place. When Jesus was baptized, the Heavenly Father said, this is my son. Look at him. And when Jesus would perform miracles, he was always pointing people back to the Father a life marked with putting someone else out in front by making God the hero of our story. Because Joseph made God the hero of his story, and we have to make Jesus the hero of ours. See, it's a sucker's choice to say, will I be the victim, the villain, or the hero? We say, no, Jesus is the main character of my story, and that's what Joseph did. Because the truth is, is that Joseph, that's a great story, but it all just points to Jesus because Jesus is the true and better Joseph. And so finally, this story reached its culmination. Finally, Joseph's brothers show up in the middle of a famine, and they're looking for food, and who's in charge of the food in the nation? It's Joseph. And they have to face their brother, who they attempted to murder and ended up betraying. And Joseph doesn't sulk about the lost years. He doesn't cast his brothers out. He says, what God meant for e- what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And not only did Joseph live a story worth telling, he dealt his brothers a story that they can then tell. Now, Joseph may have been their hero in that moment, but Joseph was always saying, it's God who is worthy of more honor than for me to take vengeance on you. He valued connection over revenge. And this is the gospel. Joseph was willing to lose himself and we want to write a great story, man. We want to be, we want to make things happen and be dad of the year and mom of the year and businessman of the year and all these different things. But we have to be willing to lose ourselves in order to be found in God's grace. My wife and I were just talking about this, that empty is the only perfect place for us to receive. And it's all throughout the gospel when Jesus would say, you have to lose your life to find it. The last will become first. He becomes more and I become less. That's the words of John the Baptist. I just heard five rules of manhood that every man that need, needs to learn, and this applies across gender. It says this, life is hard. You're not in control. Life's not about you. You're not that important, and you're going to die. I said that to my wife. She says, Tyler, that's depressing. Don't say that in church. Okay? And all of those rules require us to put Jesus as the main character, as the hero of our story. Otherwise, a man would be condemned to childhood if he doesn't learn those rules. And so we write our story, we write the story of our lives one decision at a time. Think about Joseph's story if he had made a few different choices. Think about it. Sold into slavery, works his way up, but then sleeps with with Potiphar's wife. Then what? We lose the rest. He never gets put in prison. He never interprets the dream. He never works his way up and never forgives his brothers. One of those brothers ends up being in the lineage of Jesus. Every 
decision we make writes the story of our lives. And so I want to encourage you in whatever suffering you're facing to trust God in the middle of it because that always writes a better story. And so just like we saw Joseph capitalizing on his gifts, I want to encourage you to capitalize on your gifts, not for the sake of fame or glory, but for the sake of serving others. We just had a story come out of our church. This is in Bridge Church. This happened last week where a woman, uh, her car broke down. She's a single mom and she has a lot of kids, okay? Car broke down and she had no way to get to work, had no way to get her kids to where they needed to go. And her community, her serve group leader, she serves here at Bridge Church, her serve group leader stepped up and gave her a ride to wherever she needed to go. She says, you will get to where you need to go in order until your car is fixed. And then her bridge group leader used the gifts that he had to fix her car. And now she's back on the road. And so I'll tell you, though this may seem just kind of like a left turn, that using your gifts and the suffering you may face, whatever conflict it is, will always write a better story when you do it in the context of a community. This woman faced conflict and people capitalized on their gifts and because of her connections, she was able to get to where she needed to go. And I love that story. So I want to encourage you, man, if, if you come on a Sunday morning and you're just here and you don't really know anybody, I want to encourage you to stick around talk to people, get to know somebody, because stories are all, better stories are always written in the context of a community. If you're not a part of a bridge group, I want you to go to bridgechurch.net slash bridge groups and join a group. And join a group because these stories are always read, better written in the context of community. And here's the last takeaway. Whether it's with your gifts and your talents and your abilities or it's in the midst of your conflict and your suffering, worship just giving God honor is never the wrong answer. Worship and giving God honor never makes your story worse. It always makes your story better. And this is why they say that those people, man, if you look around, especially when, when you look around, sometimes the people who suffer the most tend to sing the loudest. Sometimes the people that, and I'm not talking about the volume of your voice, I'm just talking about your heart. Sometimes the people who suffer the most sing the loudest because they know that all I can do, I have no control over my conflict. All I can do right now is give God honor because I know that he's worthy. And so in my suffering, in my gifts, my relationships, what story do I want to tell when this is just a story that I tell? Would you stand with me as I pray for you as we respond in worship? Before I pray, I want to let you know that a couple prayer team members are going to take their position over by uh, our Oconomowoc altar, which is right by the balcony. It's beautiful. Uh, if you have a need in your life, I want to encourage you not to leave this place without receiving a word of prayer. Uh, we see miracles happening in our church, people being healed of their physical disabilities and injuries. I want to encourage you to step out as hard as and uncomfortable as it can be and receive a word of prayer this morning. Let me pray for everybody, though. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. And I pray that as we uh, respond, I pray that you would minister to us as individuals. King Jesus, we trust you with our conflict. We trust you with our gifts. And we trust you because you have been so gracious to us. Help us as individuals to write a story worth telling. And help us as a body as a group, as a church, as an expression of your love to write a story worth telling so that when this is all a story we tell, it's a story that we're proud to tell. And it's a story that above all gives you honor and praise. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's respond in worship.